Hello, welcome to Uncommon Leadership. I'm Michael Hunter with Uncommon Teams. Today, I'm talking with George Dinwiddie. For the past 18 years, George has been an independent consultant, helping organizations learn to develop software more effectively. This follows two dozen years in hardware and software development. Right now, he's also exploring ways that people can make better decisions for themselves and their organizations, and he's happy to talk with people about that. Welcome, George. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you here. Looking forward to our conversation. As you reflect back over your journey to building Uncommon Teams, seeing people as people, and learning to leverage the unique gifts that they each bring, when did you first recognize that this might be a valuable approach? When did I first recognize it? Well, I remember um, back when I was a young kid, I don't know how old I was, then um, uh, we, we had a woman who would come in on sa half day on Saturdays and do ironing and help my mother clean the house. And um, I used to talk with her while she was ironing. And, and I remember one day she said to me, I was mad at my mother about something. And, and Lucille said, don't be mad at your mother. She's doing the best she can. And that was a that, that was a point of view that, that uh, my mother couldn't teach me. Um, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and it, I still think about that. And. So trying to see things from from someone else's point of view has uh, become a big thing. And then uh, back in the early 2000s, when I was getting into extreme programming, then uh, I met Dale Emery on the extreme programming list. And Dale was always good at asking, you know, the, the questions that go to the heart of the matter. And, uh, and he reintroduced me to Jerry Weinberg, who I'd met briefly on CompuServe some years before, but Jerry didn't much like the the uh, the way CompuServe worked and and set up his own own uh, uh, method of uh, communicating with with people. Um, so that got me back into that and, and got me into reading Jerry's books and you know which are about the the people aspects of software development. Yeah, Jerry has been a key influence in my journey as well. And actually, on one of his email lists is where you and I first met, I believe. Probably so. Yeah, the Shape Forum. That sounds right. I cannot remember the name. Yeah. Uh, software is a human activity performed effectively. And that's what this conversation is all about. Um, what... As you think back over all those times where you've been trying to get into someone else's point of view, is there a time that especially surprised you once you understood where they were coming from? A time that especially surprised me. Hmm. Um, I, uh, I have uh, surprises all the time because I'm not very good at predicting people. Um, and, and, and so, you know, it, it, it takes listening. It takes listening. And, and so I'm no longer, I'm not so much surprised by, by people coming from different ways um, because I expect that. But sometimes it's harder for me to, to, to really understand their point of view. Um, I've, uh, particularly in people who have a very strong opinion of there is one right way for things. Uh, it, 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 that's still a little hard for me to get my head around. If you look at the, you know, take any of the Myers-Briggs uh, uh, instruments or, or pseudo instruments, then uh, the one thing I'm really strong on is the, the P dimension rather than J. It's so, um, you know, I, I like to let let things happen and see how it comes comes out. I don't like to 
to fence myself in. Yes, that that is something that has always bemused me as well. People will say, well, this is what happened. And I'm looking at it. Well, I see three other things that might have been going on. And <laughs> oftentimes when I'm working with teams, I've heard three or five or 10 or 50 other versions of what happened, which have some similarities. And they all have very different uh, views on what happened as well. And right. <laughs> I've learned not to say, well, that's not really what happened. Well, and, and in terms of retrospectives, team retrospectives, that's why it's so important for the team to look at the data together. And, and so many people overlook that aspect. They think that, oh, we've got, you know, this small group of people who've been working together in one room for two weeks. You know, they all know what happened. But no, they all had different views of what happened. They saw different things. They focused on different things. They interpreted the, the, the same things differently. Um, so if you don't if you don't share that information to start with, you don't have any foundation to build on. And even if they had actually managed to have all viewed exactly the same things of happening in exactly the same ways, they almost certainly would have different emotions about mm -hmm. what had happened and different emotions about those emotions. Right. And so they wouldn't have had the same experience. Exactly, exactly, and, and 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 they've got different different rules that they've you know developed over the years, starting from early childhood, about you know what's permissible for them to say or do and what's not. Yes, how important have you found bringing these aspects of team dynamics out? invisible and working through to be with teams? I found it hugely, hugely important. Um, you know, it's it's something that has to be done with some subtlety. You know, it's, it, uh, you, you can overload people very quickly. But uh, but trying to tease out some of the stuff, you know, one of the things that Jerry used to call the rule of three, if I haven't thought of three ways of interpreting this, then I haven't thought about it enough. And and I use that, you know, probably daily in my own personal life. Um, but then I also try to, to, to share that with other people when they're sure of you know one way of looking at it or one way of interpreting it or one option to take to think of some others because what i found in my own um life is when i'm stuck on just two options well one of them is is the one that i you know thought of that i want to do or you know that, that attracts me and the other is just a foil to make the first one look good and and you get stuck in this uh -huh. This linear binary choice. And when I think of the, you know, sometimes it's hard to think of the third one. But when I think of that, then I break that, you know, that one dimensional uh, view. And I can think of four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten really quickly, usually. And so yeah. it, it produces a lot more options. I find the same. Um, I think Jerry put it is something like, if you only have one option, you don't have an option. If you have two options, you still don't have options, you have a dilemma. But if you have three options, now you start having real options. And often you can see many, many more. Yeah. And and of course, Jerry got that from Virginia Satir. And okay. uh, I've, I've been, uh, I've been trying to find, you know, I haven't found any place Virginia wrote that. But the, you know, most of her work is in videos. So I've been trying to find it there and, and asking people who knew Virginia personally. And, and uh, so it's, it's recognizable to people, but I haven't found the, you know, any exact quote yet. Okay. I didn't realize you got it from there. I've learned one more thing today. So, you know, um, Studying with Jerry has had a huge impact on on my view of these things. And then through Jerry, 
getting to understand a little bit about Virginia Steer. And uh, so, so now I've, I've become uh, uh, somewhat involved with the uh, Virginia Satir Global Network, and um, and I learn, um, and I've met a lot of people who work directly with Virginia, which has been fascinating. I just talked with Esther Derby. Uh, her interview will release a little before yours, and she worked with Virginia for a year, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, I can only imagine what that experience may have been like, like Jerry plus plus, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, talking with people who spent a lot of time with Virginia, you know, it's it, it, it's really fascinating because little stories come out that that make her more human and, and less less godlike, and <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it make me feel like there's hope for me. <laughs> That's one of the reasons that I'm doing this show is to help all of us, even those of us who are just getting started on this journey, to know that there is there is hope for us. And all of us are struggling and all of us are succeeding. And all of us are having the impact we want to have. What other tools beyond the rule of three do you use as you ease teams in to the squishy people stuff that we may not be so comfortable with? So, so another tool I use a lot, and, and, and I don't always explain the tool itself to, to people in, in the situation, but uh, Virginia Satir's concept of congruence. Mm -hmm. And, and um, congruence is, is a, concept that started with Carl Rogers about, you know, your external self matching your internal self being congruent, you know, which, it, you know, it's a geometric ge a word from geometry. Um, and Virginia took that and, and sort of dug into it a little deeper um, to get beyond the, you know, just the, the surface level similarities. Um, you know, you know, some people will say, oh, well, this person's really terrible and they act terribly, so therefore they're being congruent. But, you know, Virginia wanted to, to dig into it so that it, it, it excluded that sort of viewpoint that doesn't help. Mm -hmm. And so she, she broke it down into uh, concern for the needs of, of, the, of yourself, first of all, and concern for the needs of the other person and concern for the needs of the context. And trying to balance those needs and be aware of all, all three of those uh, is hugely powerful. It's hard. Um, and, you know, I find it's a, it's a dynamic balancing act. You know, you, you can't just say, oh, I've reached this state and, and therefore I'm good. You know, this is, it's not like Nirvana. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> You know, or or maybe it is. I don't know. I haven't reached Nirvana either. Maybe that's <laughs> it's a balancing act too. But you know, keeping in mind, and in at any moment, you know, I might might think, oh, wait a minute, I'm neglecting this need. I need to to take take that into more account. Um, you know, when 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 I and and have a an inclination to blame someone else, well, that's a clue that I'm not taking their needs into account. What were their needs that led to, you know, whatever happened? Um, and maybe, you know, maybe they needed information that I had and they didn't have. Yeah, and that takes us back to our earlier conversation about um, seeing all the different viewpoints. Right. If I can't see those other viewpoints, I'm going to have a really hard time sussing out what they might not, what what they may be needing that I'm not providing for them. Yeah. And your mention of self, other, and context reminds me of, that sounds a lot like 
when I talk with teams, I talk with them about there's each of you, what you need. And then there's the team that you all form. And it's mm -hmm. not just the collection of each of you's. It's its own entity that has its own needs. That's um, right. And maybe I've been channeling Jerry and Virginia and their self-context other not realizing. <laughs> this gives me another way to talk about that that will work better for some people. Because as you say, they need different things than what I need to explain any particular concept. Is there a particular, particularly dramatic shift that you remember seeing as you help teams work through the shift from I'm just me and I know what I need to, oh, now I'm starting to understand or even actually understanding from what the others are telling me what they need as well and helping us all get what we need individually and collectively? Um. Not not so dramatic as in in terms of suddenly, but um, I worked with one team where it was supposed to be two teams. When we came in to help this organization adopt agile software development, this was supposed to be two teams, and within the first week or, or so, then we could see that the the two things they were supposed to be working on had a lot of dependencies on each other. And so, you know, we, we put it put it to the teams, you know, do, do we want to try to, you know, make this two teams or do we want to make one large team? And, and they took one large team. Um, so it was it was way bigger than, than people suggest, you know, for a team. And um, and but it, but it ended up working really well. Um, you know, it, it took a while, little while going. But, um, you know, they had, uh, so there were two two people that were sort of, what well, they called them iteration managers. They didn't want to use scrum tech, scrum terminology. And, um, and one of them, had, you know, had been a really good take charge manager, um, very detail oriented. And, and, and one day there's something came up and she was paying attention to that and she was trying to solve the problem for them. And, you know, and I just said to her quietly, I says, you know, why are you trying to solve this for them? And she looked at me, got this puzzled look and, and started to say something. And then she didn't. And, and she became so good at leading this with, you know, and doing a lot less of the work herself. And the team really thrived. Um, became one of the highest performing teams I've, I've seen. I love that question. That's such a common uh, stumbling block as leaders move up in scope of still trying to do everything themselves and not realizing that they have all these other people now that can and will actually even love to be doing all these things um, for the leader and letting the leader focus on the higher level, broader, whatever other scope that they have now. Um, yeah. That's yeah, a, a great times, example. A lot of times, you know, the, the advantage of the leader is is calling attention to things that might might be overlooked. So, yes. you know, so that they can incorporate that into their solutions also. Yeah. And I love this example shows how those interventions can be very tiny. It doesn't have to be a whole big meeting about how do we want to rearrange the team. It can just be one small question to one person that completely shifts the dynamics on the team. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and in fact, I think those tend to be more effective. It allows, you know, smaller changes more frequently and time to to you know internalize those changes and uh i i've rarely seen any anything that started with oh here's the 
here's what we're going to do. Here's the big plan, and we're going to roll this out. I've, I've rarely seen that come out well. I agree. Um, well, speaking of not coming out well, can you think of a time where you tried one of these small interventions and it didn't work? And and how did you react to that? Um, help that come into something that then did work. Um, I can't think of anything specific at the moment, um, but I think that's because most small interventions, you know, don't seem to accomplish what I had hoped when I, you know, when I said something. Um, and and so I, I'm okay with that. And sometimes, sometimes you know, it, it it did make a difference, but it takes a while for it for it to be absorbed. Um, other times, well, you know, I just I didn't reach, I didn't communicate it in a way that reached the other person. Um, or maybe I'm trying to solve a problem that you know isn't the problem they want to solve. And 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 that's okay. Um, so so I'm comfortable with that now. Uh, so it, it, my concern is I don't want to cause damage. You know, if it takes longer for for things to converge on on you know what looks like a good path, and it may not be the path that I thought was the best, but then it's not just my choice. As long as it's a path that seems to be leading in a productive direction for the people concerned, then that's okay. And even if it doesn't seem to be leading in a productive direction, as long as we're taking tiny steps, then they're getting to learn what these decisions, the effects that they're having, and may actually get to a, to a productive place faster by mm -hmm. taking these seeming detours. Yeah, I, I guess the, the I, I don't I don't remember the exact words you used, but I guess the you know the situations that that sort of where it just doesn't work are are the ones where somebody in the organization has hired me to come in and and what and effectively fix these other people. And those people, you know, they know that there's this dynamic within the organization, and um, I'm, I may not be aware of that at first, you know, and they don't want me there at all. Um, and, and so that's always trouble. Uh, sometimes you can get beyond that. Uh, you know, sometimes you can, you know, by listening to the people uh, involved, and uh, understanding their needs and their way of viewing it, you know, then you can get around that and, you know, help them understand that you're there to help them. Well, I'm there to help them. I guess not all, all consultants that come in are. <laughs> and you can get around that and, 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 and get some good things done. Other times, you know, it, the, uh, the situation is so poisoned before I get there that, uh, you know, I, I can't make any progress. I, you know, I had a team one time, team lead tell me, you know, you know, we don't need any consultants. <laughs> <laughs> and and to be honest, um, you know, a lot of the problems they were having were, were, were really instigated by the manager. And, uh, you know, I tried to set up some meetings with, with him to talk about things. And I think he realized that, that, that I was going to talk about him instead of about the teams. And then he started avoiding me, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he'd set up a meeting and, and then he'd be out of town that day. <laughs> he would set up the meeting and be out of town. Yes. Wow. He really didn't want to face up to something. It sounds like. So, you know, um, you know, I, like like that that iteration manager. I can't really do it for them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I can help them, but they have to be along. You know, to you know, for doing the work themselves. Yeah. What else should I ask you today, George? 
Oh, what should you ask me? Um, uh, well, one thing you mentioned before we started was was about the biggest struggle. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I struggle with the most is is reacting too quickly. Mm. And this is also something you know from Virginia Satir, you know the um, her interaction model. You know, it's you go through all these different different things, you know, from what what you thought you heard, and you know what that means to you, and how you feel about it, how you feel about how you feel about it, you know, and and to a reaction, a response, and that happens so quickly. And it's really hard to sometimes to slow that down and leave some space so that you can respond most appropriately. Yeah. Do you have a particular tool or technique that you use to help you take that pause? Uh, no, I don't. I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> I just I'll let you know, know if I'm, I find I'm aware one. of it, and I try to you know I try to be conscious of it at the time. And, you know, it's, it, you know, sometimes I'm most aware aware of it when I've, you know, just said the wrong thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that's why it's still my biggest struggle <laughs> is because it still, it still, you know, triggers me. It's still, I still trip up on that. Yeah. What would you like to leave our listeners with today, George? Um, that the, the most important thing is making contact, making authentic contact. You know, you, you have to, you have to be who you are, but you also have to let them be who they are and get some understanding of each other. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's not something we're, we're necessarily taught, particularly in technical fields. But uh, it it takes some time to do that well, and um, some people are have more experience and you know more skill at that than others. Yeah, thank you. You have some handouts for our listeners. Do you tell us about those? Oh um, well, on my uh, on ideacomputing.com/slash/publications. Then I have a number of handouts that I've created over time um, that, uh, you know, that could be helpful. Um, I, uh, uh, one, one that uh, a lot of people have found helpful in, in recent years is uh, one I did on, on limiting work to capacity. That's that's a problem I see so many places. You know, there's so much thing, so many things that people want to get done, and so they pile the work onto the team, and so the team can't get it all done. So they put more pressure on, and it gets worse and worse. Yeah, and yeah. and especially where there's planned work plus unplanned work that has to be done. And so I created a handout. It was specifically for an ops team, and uh, because. They were basically filling up their schedule with planned work, but then there was, you know, unplanned work that was added as things went, you know, they were trying to work in, in uh, you know, two-week increments aligned with the development teams. And uh, so they'd fill up two weeks worth of, worth of planned work, and then there'd be, you know, things, you know, oh, this disk drive failed. Oh, you know, this... Uh, this project ran out of, of space, storage space, you know, and so their machine has to be upgraded. And <laughs> and uh, so it just, you know, had them for a week, you know, keep rough track of, of how much planned work, unplanned work and, and um, overhead, you know, meetings and such mm -hmm. took up their time and then use that as a rough guide when they were planning how much they were going to take on. Yeah. Nice. I imagine they were surprised what they found. Well, it, it was really interesting that even the people who were dumping work on them were much, much happier, even though they were taking on less work, you know, to start with. They ended up being much happier very quickly because things actually got done instead of half done. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where can people find you and what's the best way for them to connect with you? Okay. Um, so, so my company website, idiacomputing.com, and it has links to, to various other places to find me, including my blog, which is blog.gdinwitty.com. Um, I, I don't blog as much these days. I've been writing a newsletter um, roughly monthly and um, that's on ideacomputing.com slash newsletter. But if you go to ideacomputing.com, then, you know, the links are there. Okay, great. And I'll put links to all those in the show notes. Any last, last words for us today, George? Um, just, you know, go out, under you know, work at understanding yourself, work at understanding the world around you, and thrive. That's what this show is all about. Thank you for a perfect ending. And listeners and viewers, have an edifying day. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us on Uncommon Leadership today. If you found these stories interesting, inspiring, and illuminating, sign up for my newsletter. Hop over to uncommonteams.com and use the form at the top of every page. You'll be the first to know about every new episode of Uncommon Leadership. You'll also discover how you can build Uncommon Teams. If you'd like to chat about doing that yourself, email me, michael at uncommonteams.com, or use the contact form on my website. Thanks so much.